I'm Peter Stern, and before I uh, introduce our two eminent panelists today, I thought it would be worthwhile to add just a footnote to the previous session, um, particularly with regard to the very suggestive paper that, um, that Jeff presented. Um, you know, there was talk in the previous session about strong dissents and thunderbolts from the bench, uh, glowering, um, all true. All true, but I thought it was important to round out the picture by drawing attention to something else that I think was very important to Judge Noonan, and that's what you might call the notion of concord. Um, before I started in the judges' chambers, uh, I called Evelyn to kind of try to get the lay of the land, and at that time, I had uh, a very young son. He was six months old, and Evelyn said, Oh, please share that with the judge. He'll be, he'll be very glad to hear about your family. In fact, he kind of thinks of the chambers as a family. It's very important to him that everyone gets along. And I really found that to be true. The other thing that sticks in my mind is, on a number of occasions, I can remember him coming back from a week out riding the circuit and him walking in the door on Monday morning and putting his briefcase down and with a big smile on his face saying, we agreed on everything, <laughs> no dissents. That was a source of real satisfaction to him. So I think it's important to counterbalance the, the, the speaking, uh, speaking his mind with what was often a very consensual and, and, and com important commitment to Concord. Uh, so with that, let me um, then begin to turn things over um, to, the, to the two panelists. Um, they're going to be speaking on um, two very interesting and important topics in the area of legal history. I'd like to introduce Emanuele Conte and uh, Beatrice Pasciutta. Emanuele and I go way back. We both shared... Um, I guess there were not even any cubicles then. We both sort of shared a, a shared space at the Robbins Collection in 1990 uh, when he was a young scholar and I was a law student. Um, and um, we, we just we shared a picture uh, that was taken back then over lunch, which I'll show to anybody if the price is right. Um, uh, it was a very, very happy time, and I'm delighted to see him again after 29 years. And I'm also um, thrilled to, uh, to meet Beatrice. Uh, Emanuele uh, teaches legal history at Rome, and Beatrice is in Palermo. So without further ado, um, you know, we haven't, who, who would like to go first? That's one detail that we did not discuss. Emanuele, do you want to kick things? It, it, it doesn't matter. Okay. Eman <laughs> Emanuele, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I have not been so lucky to make personal acquaintance with John Noonan. When I spent that full summer in Berkeley as a Robbins Fellow in 1990, we had a wonderful time with Peter and Laurent Mayeli, but it was too late to meet uh, John Noonan as a law professor at Bolto. Uh, this, that is one of the reasons why I I'm, I'm wish to thank uh, Laurent and uh, Peter for inviting me today because this gave me the opportunity to have a closer look to the inspiring writings of the judge and scholar we honor today. One can have an idea of his personality thanks to his inclination to write books and articles from a pretty personal point of view, even with some indulgence to autobiography which is very rare among legal historians. Noonan was aware of the fact that history, and particularly the history of ideas, is never objective. And he felt the crucial importance of declaring his personal position when he dealt with the history of constitutional values. That is why the first chapter of his book on religious freedom in America, 1998, is a short account of his personal experience as a Catholic in a multi-confessional environment as was Massachusetts before and after the Second World War. 
his personal story is displayed to his reader to make clear that he couldn't see the history if not through his own eyes. The point of view of John Noonan on history was then influenced by his personal experience, an American Catholic who felt the need for change of the church during the 1940s and 50s and got personally involved in the effort for reformation performed by the Catholic Church during the Second Vatican Council. Actually, for a Catholic scholar who professionally deals with the history of moral and legal theories, the problem of change is absolutely crucial. The tension between permanent identitarian values and the need to change and correct its doctrines in order to meet the transformations of the world is particularly evident for an institution as the church. If the universal, universal Christian community, that is the Catholic church, is ruled by divine precepts, how is it possible to think of an evolution or a change? If the church is really the body of Christ, how can it change its doctrines through time? How can time influence the revealed truth? I quote, in the back of my mind, writes Noonan in his 1998 book, I was aware of a much larger question, the relation of history to the teaching of the church, the question to which I have returned again and again, end quote. Indeed, some seven years later, by tackling directly the question of change in the church, Noonan goes back again and again on the same question, recalling also his personal experience at the Council of Rome, when the new acknowledgement of the freedom of individual conscience led to a sharp criticism by traditionalists. They, I quote, attacked the very reason Catholic liberalism, end quote, identified with innovative theologians like Maritain, Marais, and the Dominican theologian and historians of uh, uh, legal doctrines, Yves Congar. In the eyes of an historian like Noonan, the problem was precisely historical. Can this institution admit that her official doctrine professed for 15 centuries was simply wrong? My point today is to show that this tension between identity and change is not limited to a venerable institution like the church. It affects also the national states. In other words, with a broader meaning, can the church or a state legislate against its tradition? Can a new law reverse the set of values that had been traditionally observed affirming that, that what was felt like right was actually wrong, unfair. For a legal historian, this conflict between legal tradition and statutory innovation is a constant issue, one that inspired thousands of pages of legal historiography. For us, the continental legal historians, the study of our past has been often considered as a search for legal identity, much more than a survey of the evolution of a society and a statement of the terms which impressed or registered a major ch change in the law. It is by reading Noonan that I realized that this question has been raised at first regarding the church. This was clear in the late 18th century, when the idea of a Christian identity for the whole of Europe collapsed. Uh, and also the secular state had the same problem of the church, how to fix the opposition between identity and rational innovation. The legislation as the expression of enlightened government had its very effective supporters at the end of 18th century. 
In France, the revolutionary ideas proposed the loi as the most powerful tool to fight ignorance, superstition, inequality among citizens, arrogance of the power. This is very clear by reading the writings of the philosophers. But I want to take another example, maybe more suggestive. It, it regards a song which was sung by revolutionary people in France before the big success of the Marseillaise, who became the most important uh, song of the revolution only in 1792 in August. Before that, uh, the revolutionary sang a song which was called Ça ira, perhaps inspired by Benjamin Franklin, who, when questioned by Frenchmen about the fate of the American Revolution, answered in his broken French, ça ira, it will be fine. Well, the text of this very popular song witnesses the persisting influence of Christian values even during the first phase of the revolution. But on the same time, it shows the new confidence in the healthy power of new legislation. I read in French for uh, our French-speaking audience. Celui qui s'élève, on la baissera. Je, uh, I, I, I don't sing for your... Uh, <laughs> even if it is very easy to sing. Uh, celui qui s'abaisse, on le levera. Le vrai catéchisme nous instruira et l'affreux fanatisme s'étendra. Which is, the one who puts on air shall be brought down. These are gospel words. And the one who is humble shall be elevated. And the true catechism will, uh, sh uh, shall instruct us. But in the same song, it is clear that the most powerful instrument to realize this Christian prophecy is the statutory law. The new gospel is the one of the lawmaker. Uh, which every French should follow. Suivant les maximes de l'évangile, du législateur, tout s'accomplira. Every French shall train at being obedient at the law, at the new law of the legislature. It is the new legislation which will perform revolution, revolutionary purposes. Only new statutes can teach the people to get rid of ancient superstitious beliefs. A new society made of free and equal citizens will be installed by the force of new laws imposed by a legislative assembly which truly represented the people of the French nation. As everyone knows, this ideology brought to a radically innovating system of private and public law in France. New legislation took the form of codification, and the Code des Français, issued by Napoleon in 1804, has been since then considered as the prototype of every legislative innovation and also as the civil constitution of the new state. Despite the initial attempts to connect the revolution to Christian values, the church took all this very badly, making every effort for fighting against the ideas that fueled the revolution first and then the bourgeois individualism. Being a careful reader of John Henry Newman, John Noonan was very much aware of all this. In different essays, he recalls the papal condemnation of the French priest and intellectual Félicité de la Menée, who in 1830 had founded a Catholic journal, L'Avenir, which considered the great change that happened in France since 1789 as part of the design of God, and called the Catholics to deal with the future instead of blaming the present, regret the past, and plead for return of the Ancien Regime. So in 1832, uh, the Pope Gregory uh, XVI damned La Menée, attacking, attacking the rights and liberties recognized to individuals by modern constitutions, including the freedom of speech and the free press. Not only the church blamed the new regime, it blamed uh, the hubris of legislators who dared to issue new laws against the ancient tradition, calling them superstition, and used the tyrannic power of the state 
to impose a new unjust setting to the society. But in the 19th century, Catholic Church was not the only enemy of the new legislation and of its most important outcome, the codification. Another major opponent was the new jurisprudence born in Germany, based on the exaltation of the national history as the only real source of legitimation for a legal system. Let me remind some well-known elements. Born in Germany during the years of expansion, decline, and fall of the Napoleonic Empire, the German historical school developed the most effective system of arguments to defy the modern confidence in the transformative power of statutory law. Famously, Savigny raised in 1814 against the idea of a new codification for Germany. His major argument was strong enough to found a new school of jurisprudence. It was based on the use of histories as the most effective way to grasp the Volksgeist, that is the spirit of the people. The Volksgeist is the internal authority that gives binding force to the law. Then a legal principle is not binding because it has been legally statued by the, the, the legislator, but because it reflected a substantial justice that was felt as such by the collective conscience of the people. I do not want to repeat well-known information for this very learned audience. I just quick remember that the Middle Ages was at the core of this 19th century theory. That um, Savigny devoted more than 40 years of research to his extraordinary history of Roman law in the Middle Ages, planned since 1804, published the first time in 1815, and republished in second edition from 1834 to 1841, almost 50 years, half, half a century of work. Uh, about the history of Roman law in the Middle Ages. But the medieval history of Roman law was a powerful argument to justify the construction of German private law uh, on the base of history of German people. It, is, it was during the Middle Ages that German rulers of Europe had been so lucky to rediscover the ancient laws of Rome and had been so enlightened to take them over, making them a German heritage. It was the passage through the German Middle Ages that made the Roman law an expression of the German Volksgeist. This historical argument was strong enough to promote the European success of the pandectistic, that is the study of the Roman law for the present purposes. Uh, being able to impose the principle of the Justinian law in the 19th century Europe, the rhetoric of history claimed also for refusing the transformative power of legislation and for the prevalence of the national tradition over the rational innovation. Um, at the same time, in the same 19th century, a second strand of the same historical school uh, arose in Germany. It was called the strand of the Germanist. Uh, lawyers and historians like Bezeler and Gierke claimed for the historical existence of a truly original German tradition, one that conflicted with some principle of Roman law. Since then, the history of medieval law has been taught, not only in Germany, but also in France and in Italy, for instance, as the permanent confrontation of two systems, often in conflict with each other, the Roman learned jurisprudence and the German spontaneous legal values. Individual property was Roman. Communitarian ownership was German. Formalism in contracts was Roman. Balance of interest with, and good faith was German. Respect for individual rights was Roman, while communitarian care was German. 
born in Germany and justified in some sense in the German political situation of the 19th century, this articulation of legal history in two great system, competing system, has been adopted everywhere in continental Europe. Now, I remember all this because the approach to history, which has affirmed itself within the legal culture in the continent of Europe, depend on these 19th century foundations of modern legal historiography. As the beginning of modern legal historiography was marked by the need of offering an argument to justify a national legal identity, it was natural for legal historians to pay no attention to the turning points of history. European legal history neglected fractures to exalt continuities. It denied the transformative power of new legislation and new statutes. It admitted as effective new legislation only when it reflected the feeling of the people that is the deep system of popular legal values. Legal history was then an exercise of searching for permanent values, much more than a reconstruction of historical happenings. The history of the law was narrated as an history where nothing happens, or nothing should have happened. Uh, on the specific subject of the history of legislation, the landmark study still influential today is Fritz Kern's immensely successful book, uh, Recht und Verfassung im Mittelalter, first pu published exactly one century ago in 1919, then translated into English in 1939, and then translated in different other languages until this present century. The titles given to the first paragraph of the book make the main points of Kern's thesis admirably clear. These are the titles. Law is old. Law is good. The good old law is unenacted and unwritten. Old law breaks new law. Legal innovation is restoration of the good old, old law. So, for Gierke and Kern, and for someone until today, legal historians kept praising the stability of custom uh, against new legislation, identity against innovation. The same attitude has been adopted to explain the construction of legal, of legal doctrine. Legal historians maintain that legal theories witnessed by scholarly literature since the 12th century never introduced new institutions. Following the mainstream interpretation, lawyers would have limited themselves to offer a logical and rational description of the legal values which were deeply engraved in the heart of the people. A good example of this attitude is the story of one of the most important and influential doctrinal constitution of the Middle Ages, the so-called dominium utile. The legal phrase dominium utile is commonly known to express the property rights enjoyed by the person to whom a fief has been granted. Dominus utilis was also called the beneficiary of another form of entitlement on the property which had been conveyed to him. The Lord who had made the grant maintained for himself only a kind of abstract ownership known as the dominium directum. The new concept of a double property of the same object had been invented by a medieval law professor teaching on the base of Roman law of the Justinian copulation. However, neither this formula, dominium utile, nor its legal substance appear in the sources of Roman law. It was certainly an invention by medieval legal scholars, one that contravenes the fundamental principle of classical Roman law, which is clearly stated in the digest two individuals cannot exercise a dominion over the same thing at the same time. 
Then the question is, how did the glossators succeed in subverting so blatantly their textual authorities? And why did they do it? The answer given by legal historians is once again based on stability and cultural identity. In the very context of property rights, 19th century Germanist scholarship assumed that the northern peoples introduced in Europe a typically Germanic form of property called Gewehre and translated into English as Sazin. The Germanic idea of property was deeply different from the Roman one, but was adopted by the whole of Europe. Then the Roman law was rediscovered in the 12th century, and the first generation of jurists had the problem of applying an ancient legal vocabulary to a real reality made of medieval institution. And for this reason, they were compelled to tamper with their reading of Roman law text as to apply them to ancestral legal structures completely foreign to them. The dominium utile then has been described as the necessary adaptation of Roman categories to Germanic idea of property. This is an extremely durable interpretation key for legal historians. Even today, when the old nationalistic idea of a German law diffused everywhere has been more or less dismissed, the general narrative had not changed. It tells of a diffused customary form of property and of the need to force the Roman categories to the reality of the reap rooted traditional law. So, as we have seen for the legislation, also jurisprudence is described as unable to introduce new institutions. The construct of legal science are not explained as answers to specific cases or to an historical context which is precisely determined in time and space, but they result from immanent historical forces. Legal doctrines are nothing else than a rational dressing of these forces. Legal historians do not think that lawyers could introduce a doctrine to deal with a given historical context, even less to drive a change in the balance of powers and rights. They think that legal doctrines can describe institution, but cannot change or form them. Our learned theory of dominium divisum offer, offers a good example of this astonishing lack of interest for the interaction between legal doctrines and the surrounding world. Dozens of legal historians devoted attention to the birth of the expression dominium utile. And since more than one century, they agree that it was used for the first time by Pilius de Medicina, an Italian glossator whose biography is pretty well known. However, nobody showed any interest for the connections between his doctrinal creation and the historical context in which he worked. He was hired by the Commune of Modena to teach law in the new local university around 1180. But no legal historian ever, ever took a look of the Modenese sources. If one had, he would have easily discovered that two years later, 1182, the Commune introduced a new revolutionary statute with which land or building concessions given by ecclesiastical landowners were strongly stabilized in favor of the lessees. The landowner could not raise the rent, he could not recover his land even at the expiration of the contract, and was forced to grant the land to the same lessee for the same rent. The rights given to the lessee by these 1182 statutes are really very close to personal property. In the very same years, Pilius, the law professor in the same city, who got paid by the same commune, distorted the text of Roman law 
in order to call those tenants domini, that is, owner of a form of property, and not only lessee, depending from the will of the landowners. This historical context tells us a story which is very different from the usual one. The dominion utile does not convey in learned terms the deep values of a stabile society. It expresses the aims of a social class which took the power in northern Italy and aspired to the recognition of its rights at law. Once in power, this class used the instrument of new legislation to impose a new legal order and favored the creation of new doctrines to justify it. This means that in legal history, things happen. Not only during the revolution as designed by Harold Berman, but all the time. Law is immersed in history, and in history, things happen. Back to Noonan then. He was mainly interested in the Catholic Church and in American constitutional values. By devoting his interest to both, he felt very clearly the tension between a history used as a dispenser of identity and a history seen as a way to understand the need of change. This alternative is very clear if we deal with Catholic ecclesiology, that is the way in which Catholic Church conceives itself. If the Church is the body of Christ on earth, it should walk across history by remaining the same. This lay down the big problem of the meaning of changes in history and of the identity of an institution through time. As an American Catholic, John Noonan knew very well that ecclesiology is a constant exercise for the Church. But my point today is that ecclesiology is not just about Catholics and not even just about Christians. When the European states got rid of confessionalism, a narrative of historical identity was adopted by the new European legal culture. And legal historiography was at the core of it. The secular states entrusted to the legal history their ecclesiology, that is the self-understanding of their institutional essence. So during the 19th century, the legal historians offered to the secular states a kind of secular ecclesiology, which was pretty in tune with the contemporary Catholic ecclesiology. National identity must prevail over rational change and adaptation through legislation. In the first half of the 20th century, however, two tragic world wars have harshly showed the effects of this nationalism. After this terrible historical experience, the church questioned his institutional constituency in the council, but the state did not do the same. When John Noonan went to Rome in 1965, well, I wrote, came to Rome because I was in Rome and I. <laughs> to be part of the political commission, of, oh, sorry, of the Pontifical Commission on Contraception, he experienced the moment during which the Catholic Church questioned itself about identity and change. He kept this questioning at the center of his intellectual activity for his entire life and not only when he dealt with the history of the church, but also by approaching secular matters and American constitutional issues. But for the European states, such a questioning did not happen. Still in our 21st century, the majority of legal historians think much more in terms of identity than in terms of historical change. Civil law, canon law, customary law are still felt by scholars as systems of permanent values and not as repositories of normative arguments that form the box of tool of legislators and interpreters constantly struggling for adapting the law to the change of the society. Still today, continental legal historians History is narrated as a tale of stability and not 
has a history of tensions, fights, and change. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Emanuele. Beatrice? Well, uh, first of all, thanks to Professor Mayali and to Peter Stein for this invitation. I'm very honored to be here and also excited to, to, about talking in a so prestigious context, moreover in English, and I apologize to you for this, for my bad English, but. <laughs> well, what is the legacy of John Newman, the scholar, I mean, for an European legal historian like me? The first legacy, in my opinion, is a methodological one. Professor Noonan has always used theological sources as well as legal sources for reconstructing the history of legal concepts. Since his first book, The Scholastic Analysis of Usury, 1957, the problem of the prohibition of usury is enlightened using many kinds of different sources with no hierarchical differences between philosophy, theology, and legal thought. Uh, all these arguments are used together to reconstruct a concept and to give a solution to the research hypothesis. This is a peculiar way for us. The European way, I mean, I speak about Italy, but also about Germany, Spain, and France, and England more, uh, is to keep all these sources separate, as if there was no communication between the different spheres of knowledge. Uh, only in the few last years, something seems to change also in Europe, especially in France. Uh, the studies of Alain Bureau and Jacques Chifolot, only for quoting some contemporary French historians, bring the methodology used by John Newman back to the fore. The use of different sources appears the only way to explain the complexity of the medieval knowledge. So today, I'll present a short contribution, I hope this is short, that aims to demonstrate the intersection between law and theology. I mean, law is used to explain the theology of human redemption, while theology is used to understand the logic of trial, of legal trial. So, a procedure and the judicial way of solving conflict seem to have their origin in paradise. This quotation is from the Speculum Judiciale, the mirror of procedure, the masterwork of Guillaume Durand. Composed between 1271 and 1276, the Speculum soon became the standard handbook of Roman canonical procedure. So, according to Guillaume Durand, the first trial dates back to the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. God reprimands Adam for having disobeyed, and Adam makes his objection like a plaintive would. He accused the woman of having persuaded him to eat the apple and therefore to have seen it. At the time of the creation, God had placed man in the state of nature which means the state of grace. The sin of man against God overturns the state of nature. And when God punishes Adam and expels him from heaven, he condemns him, among other things, to eat his food, meaning that man must toil to produce his own food. So, in the state of nature, as Durand says, was no reason for disputes because all goods were common. The divine condemnation introduced ownership, and this is the first reason for disputes between men. So, for the medieval theological and legal thought, the history of humankind begins with a trial which arose from sin and ended up in the creation of ownership. There is a close relationship between trial, ownership, and sin. 
Well, at the end of the human story, there is another trial, the last judgment. According to St. Matthew's Gospel, 25, 31, 46, Christ will act as judge of all mankind in the final judgment. But during the last day of humankind, the Christ judge will not apply the law to give his judgment. Christ decides about damnation or salvation, relying instead on his deep knowledge of human behavior. It will be a terrifying scenario. Is the last judgment a trial? This is the question that we can find in the masterwork of scholastic theology, the Libri Sententiarum. And this work, composed around 1115 by Peter Lombard, was the most famous handbook of theology, used in all theology schools as Libri Legales or Decretum in law schools. Peter Lombard devotes a deep reflection about the form, the ordo, and the real nature of his last judgment. And here, legal terminology informed theological reasoning. According to Peter Lombard, the final judgment would be a judgment because of the presence of a judge, who will render a verdict. Nevertheless, it will be a, pec a peculiar trial because it will be a trial with no witnesses, no defense, and no debate. From the 12th century onwards, jurists, especially canonists, began to elaborate on the so-called ordinus judiciari. This work aimed to establish a procedure that can be applied under any circumstances and by any tribunal. Accordingly, the ordinus were used by tribunals and lawyers as well as law students. And Bulgarus, a glossator, and scholars of, of Irnerius wrote the first treatise on trial, 1130-1140, it's called the Eudigis, and he portrayed the trial as an actus trium personarum, or an act that necessarily involves three people. The plaintiff, the intendant, is the one who declares that he wants something. The offender or the defendant resist the plaintiff's request, and the judge, in medio cognoscens, is the third participant, the one who stands between the parties charged with the task of assessing truth proposed by the defendant and the plaintiff in order to provide a solution. From this perspective, the trial is an ordo, or a well-ordered and logical sequence of stages, necessary and sufficient to produce a just solution to the controversy. Such a procedure could be compared to the original trial in the Garden of Eden, but certainly not with the last judgment. This is a problem. The Ordo Judiciarius, as described within the framework of legal doctrine, is a self-perpetuating mechanism, I say. It, it is the only tool that can guarantee correct decisions anywhere for any given case. Consequently, to obtain justice, there was no further need for singular divine intervention in the form of a miracle, for example. This way, previously, an essential requirement ensuring the functioning of trials by ordeal. The procedural outline was destined to extend beyond the strictly juridical sphere. Starting from the 13th century, it became to standard format for resolving any kind of conflict. Of conflict, pardon. The features that make this outline exportable to extra juridical spheres are the following for me. One, the presence of a logical structure. A trial is made up of an ordered set of steps. The sequence of different phases ensure the solution to the litigation and ensure that this solution is the logical one and only solution. Two, the presence of an equitable character. A judge 
just and impartial, evaluates the applicability of the law to the case at hand. He avoids a purely formalistic application of a norm, which would be an aberration. Three, accessibility to anyone, any person, regardless of social and juridical status, can rely on a trial. And any person as a natural judge has the right to be heard and therefore the right to a defense. Four, applicability to all kinds of litigation. The trial is conceived as a dispute between two parties before an impartial judge who delivers a judgment the parties must respect. The structure of the trial follows the logical pattern of non-violent conflict resolution even non-strictly juridical ones. This is the reason why the model of the Ordo soon becomes a tool for a new interpretation of the biblical stories. Let me come back to the final judgment. Uh, as we saw, according to Peter Lombard, the first scholasticism maintains that the last judgment, how is described in the Matthew's Gospel, will not be a poor trial in sense of an actus trium personarum, so three person. But after the great success of the new form of the Ordo, interpreting the last judgment in other terms would have been impossible. So we can see this change of perspective in uh, another work, is the Legenda Aurea of the Dominican Jacobus de Voragine, a work written in the very same years as Durand Speculum. Here, the portrayal of humanity's final day is similar to a trial as described by legal doctrine. The Voragine discuss issues that directly apply to the legal setting, in particular, deeply over-interpreting scriptures, he reflects on the persecutors present at trial, on the witnesses, and on the uh, feature of the verdict. Uh, the Vragine says, all souls must face three persecutors in the last judgment. They are, first, the devil. He will remind us when, where, and how we seen it. And during the trial, the devil will ask Jesus for the souls of those sinners who voluntarily submitted to his dominion. The second persecutor is represented by each soul's own sin, and the third is by the world as a world because offending the creator represents an offense to the world. Uh, the same for the witnesses, uh, God, the conscience and the third witness is the guardian angel. He knows everything that a person has done and will testify against him over. And at last, the verdict. The verdict is irrevocable and unappellable, but not because of Christ, but because it matched with the three criteria, criteria established by jurists on supreme justice. A verdict is final, so is the last, if it is impossible to appeal to superior judge. And this is the case of the final judgment. No one <laughs> is superior to the Christ. Uh, second, uh, verdict is final if the crime is evident and we know the devil and the guardian angel, uh, all we know the, the crime. And third, uh, a verdict is final if the judgment cannot be postponed. Uh, it's the case, it's the final day of humankind. Uh, we have no time. So, unlike the Libri Sententiarum, the Legenda Aurea is a work devoted to predication, a work intended not as a collection of theological authorities, and the uh, that such work addresses these topics is an unequivocal sign that the procedural structure was at this point in history well known and deeply rooted even among non-jurists. The trial becomes the ideal framework for a written or imagined narration. And starting from the 13th century, trial stories are used for a didactical purposes. 
uh, I'm talking about stories uh, developed in the form of trial, but describing not truly legal issues. First of all, we can found that in sermon and exemplar, and afterward in the so-called mock trials held in heaven. The exemplar are brief stories with a pedagogical heim uh, that usually are inserted in collection of sermon and geographic works like Live of Saints, Collection of Miracles, etc. In the most ancient collection, the commonest kind of legal pattern is not the, the ordo, but it's a trial by ordeal. Uh, for example, in the work written around uh, 1214, Dialogus Miraculorum of Cesare C- of uh, Heisterbach, uh, the divine intervention a miracle or a wonder performed by a saint is necessary to overcome the limits of human judgment, both in the form of ordeals and trials. Uh, We can say that in this exemplary literature in the first half of the 13th century, uh, a trial is uh, treated in a very cursory way. No attention is paid to the procedure or to argument raised in court. After all, I think, a quarrel between two parties before a judge is certainly less impressive than a trial by ordeal with a miracle, with an iron glove, with a, with a, 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 a miracle, yes. Um, the perspective about trial and the use of human justice radically changed during the second half of the 13th century. The reason of this, of this change are due both the spread of legal culture and the abolition by canonical and secular legislation of the trial by ordeal. And so, if you look at the agenda aurea, we can see clearly this change of perspective. Here, there is no evidence of trial by ordeal. The disputes are usually described using the procedural form, a debate between two parties before a deciding judge. The trial is usually set in a dream. The sinner finds himself before a judge having to defend himself. The judge is usually God, and uh, the opponent is usually the devil. The man is defended by truth and justice, two virtues, but their arguments are not sufficient to win the devil. So the sinner asks the intervention of the Virgin Mary, the only one who has the power to defeat Satan. And in the end, the Madonna wins and the sinner returns to life and devotes himself to good. So. Arguments and respect for the procedure are the only tools that humankind has to achieve justice, heaven in heaven. God chose the legal procedure to provide the sinner with the opportunity to be saved. The goal of such a tale is to structure divine justice as human justice. The source of exemplarity is overturned, so A miraculous wonder was effective, of course, because it remains out of reach, but the imitable wonder of a celestial tribunal in which the soul have the same possibilities that men have on earth is more powerful. So justice follows the same way both in heaven and on earth. Uh, The success of the trial in heaven with the devil playing the role of the plaintiff and both virtues, justice and truth and the Madonna playing the role of lawyers are going on behalf of the sinner defendant uh, inspired the writing of long and complex works in the 14th century that are commonly known as mock trial. The most famous at least for me, because I studied, uh, is the so-called <laughs> processus satane. Uh, it appears uh, trial of Satan trial. 
it appears uh, within the body of treatises uh, by Bartolus de Saxoferrato, a famous uh, medieval jurist, of course. The text was written during the first half of the 14th century, certainly not by Bartolus, even though it was attributed to him in some manuscript from the early 15th century. Uh, the processus is a mock trial between the devil and the Virgin Mary for the possession of humankind. It is set in paradise, more precisely in celestial tribunal, in the, in the corner of paradise devoted to celestial tribunal. And uh, uh, in the preamble, uh, a narrator addresses the audience to provide a backstory. Uh, this is this. Humankind doomed because of Eve's, of Eve's sin and saved thanks to the intervention of another woman, the Virgin Mary, continues to sin. Therefore, Satan, uh, longing to possess the soul of sinners he felt unfairly deprived of, decides to take an extreme and modern route, complain before a court and ask for justice. He appoints an attorney, a devil, of course, instructing him on the claims to be made to the judge and sends him to paradise to enforce his right. And the natural judge of the devil is Christ, of course. The judge, Christ, is obliged to accept the claim which has merit, formally speaking, and allow the devil to sue humankind. The Archangel Gabriel, the messenger, of course, of the Celestial Tribunal, issues the summons, but no one appears. As a consequence, the devil, it's a good lawyer, asks humankind to be declared a willful defaulter. In this case, in fact, according to the law, he would have immediately come into possession of the res petita. In practice, this would have resulted in the enslavement of humankind. However, Christ, applying equity, which is a privilege of the judge according to the procedural medieval law, decides to grant the defendant a delay. The saints in heaven start crying and their tears are heard by the Virgin and she decides to personally defend humankind. Uh, the poor devil is the case, uh, tries to oppose. Uh, uh, he says, she can stay in court. First, because she is a woman. And the Roman law and the canon law forbids to a woman to stay in court as an attorney. And second, because she is the mother of the judge. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the trial continues with arguments of the parties, which are something harsh and vicious, almost insulting, but always respectful of the procedure foreseen by legal doctrine. They even contain allegation, the quotation of civil and canon law used by the party's attorney. The trial and and with the solemn sentence given by Christ on Easter Day in the year 1311. The sentence absolves, fortunately, humankind and again condemns the devil to stay in hell forever. Uh, the process of Satan is a union of law and theology, of course. The form is legal as is the structure of the, of the trial, but the matter in question, the object of dispute, is radically theological. Using a farcical tone and the tools of paradox and parody, the process of Satan represents an extraordinary twofold test of both law and theology. Questioning the theory of the redemption through the clever application of procedural logic is a very big challenge for the jurist. He has to find, he must find, a solution to guarantee the happy end to a trial for which the conclusion is already known. At the same time, theology can verify, using a procedural model, the logical strand of debates about redemption and the fight between good and evil and the redeeming role of Madonna that is a 
purely medieval uh, innovation. So, uh, I conclude, as this overview shows throughout the Middle Ages, procedural mechanism offered by the trial uh, to serve several purposes. And legal reasoning left its mark in field distinct from the law, showing a model of justice that human beings can and must imitate. So too, theological matters and allegorical devices leave their mark on emerging legal culture. So this test seems to suggest, suggest that the right justice is a connubium between equity and norms having consideration case by case. A formalistic use of rules, the rigor juris without equity, or quoting Professor Hussain, without empathical contact with the real life, is a diabolic use of the law, is a manifestation of the devil. And this is, I think, the second legacy of John Newman, in my point of view, this is the manifestation of the infernal logic of the Dante's comedy. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Beatrice and Emanuele. Um, do we have questions for our panelists or observations, reflections from a historical point of view? It, well, it's a very short but very broad question in the sense that <laughs> canon law, in, in, uh, at the end of 19th century, uh, the German historical school uh, began to consider canon law as an historical object and not as a part of uh, the present canon law. So during the 19th century, canonists were concerned with the history of canon law only in order to understand the present canon law of their time. Uh, at the very end of, uh, of the 19th century, or, or better, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, the sign that canon law was also considered as an object of history, not for uh, canonists, is the foundation of the third strand of the German uh, most important review, the, the, the Zeitschrift of Savigny Stiftung, who split it in two, Roman law and German law, around uh, 1880 something, and created the third uh, Abteilung, the third section, at the beginning of, of uh, the 20th century. At that time, they started to think that canon law was uh, actually important, but canon law remained a little bit separated by uh, the, the great legal history. It goes uh, his, its own path, so to say, in my vision. And so specialists of canon law are very often only concerned with canon law sources, and they do not consider enough uh, um, historical context as uh, I show it for the case of uh, uh, um, Dominium Utile for the civil law. We can make the same point for uh, some uh, canon law constructions, doctrinal construction, uh, which do not uh, take account enough of the very innovative ecclesiastical legislation which changes everything. So Beatrice now mentioned the decision in 1215 to abolish a deal, which means to prohibit uh, the clerk to, uh, uh, to be present at ordeal. It is a major, enormous change which inflict an enormous change of mentality to the society, not only for the church. It, it is not an ecclesiastical issue. It is a social issue, which changes completely the way to think of the trial. We do not stay there waiting for God showing us the reality. We decide a very artificial, abstract procedure to find our human reality. And this became, so, this became so important that even theology got explained through this very artificial mechanism. 
you know? So it isn't happening. Hmm? But it is difficult to, to read in a canon law uh, historiography uh, this attention to things that happen, to the law which changes in, con in contact with change of the social, economical, and political context. I think there's a question in the back, first off. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, uh, my question is for uh, also for Professor Conte. Um, I was very interested in your account, your um, characterization of, as it were, uh, an eventful history in conflict to a degree with an uneventful legal history, a, tr a more traditional uneventful legal history. And I, I wonder if you would care to comment on uh, the current moment in European legal history in which uh, one sees um, some emergence of contest over, for example, the role of legal history vis-a-vis -vis the revival or the attempted revival by some German scholars of a jus commune for an ever closer European Union, um, the emergence of a commitment to a form of comparative legal history, mm -hmm. which is uh, really quite pluralist in some of its imaginings. Uh, whether you see the eventful history that you refer to um, as a, a real resurgence of something quite distinct for a European legal history. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, things are changing, of course, and there are many interesting uh, scholars now who are dealing with legalism. Not all of them are in the law schools. Many of them come from an education in history, so they are more acquainted with the idea of uh, historical context. Uh, f when legal history is used as a political or broadly, let's say, constitutional argument, it goes back to the idea of, of stability and identity. Let's take the example you mentioned on jus commune. Uh, when uh, Europe started to be, well, to, to dream to be united, uh, this historiographical construction of the 30s made in Italy by Francesco Calasso was assumed by Europe to uh, affirm that there was, since the Middle Ages, a legal community in, of the continent. And that we were one before uh, we split in different nations. And that we have to recover this ancient statute as one only uh, legal system. But this is again uh, unhistorical because there were everything in, in the Middle Ages. There were arguments to say that we apply the same structure here and there in, uh, in Ireland and in Sicily, in Portugal and in Poland but also that uh, the Portuguese and, uh, and the Germans and uh, the, the, the citizens of Siena and of tiny small cities wanted to be autonomous from the central power. So we have a tension and uh, in a certain place, in a certain here, in a certain context, these different arguments were used in different ways. So law uses arguments of unity and arguments of autonomy in order to cope with the context, with what happens in a certain situation, you know? So uh, in some sense, I think I, I follow the idea of, uh, of Maitland. I, I, I've sung at this by thinking of that a famous phrase of, John, of uh, Frederick Maitland, 1901, who says, today we study the day before yesterday in order that yesterday may not paralyze today and today may not paralyze tomorrow. So there is no point in saying we are always the same. 
because the point is not being the same. The point is being ourselves in order to face the change. This is the point. I think we have to study history, of course, but not in order to go back as we were once, but in order to be aware and to be ready to face the future. Uh, thank you both. I, I found both of these absolutely fascinating. Um, two, two quick maybe comments or questions. First, with regards to history, especially the medieval understanding of law and history, I think you have to also marry that with a med medieval understanding of metaphysics and, and philosophical anthropology, which saw in human beings a nature that was, of course, unchanging. And so because law, especially natural law, is reason's participation in the eternal law, that law is something one can discern as an objective reality with regards to human nature. I think in time, we understand that there's much more flexibility than that, um, and that structures of, of human society are given to much more change. Um, and although perhaps we've gone too far in the other direction, because I think some of the excesses of, of, of the 20th century especially are in the loss of human nature, um, and therefore the dignity of human nature. So when you lose that conception of human nature as transcendent to law, then law becomes simply an expression of will. And law as merely an expression of will is the road to tyranny. It's the road to, uh, to tyrannical structures which we've seen en masse in, in the 20th century. So I think you're right that, that we need to maintain this concept of history, but that has to also be joined with it, a concept of what human nature is, uh, because uh, th that shared humanity makes us subject to law, and there are aspects of that which are in fact unchangeable, and which do need to transcend law. I think in some way in the United States we see uh, the, the first, the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to our Constitution as a way of reflecting human nature that needs to transcend law as well, and I, so I think a uh, reclaiming this idea of this unity in law between, in, in, in a certain way, a unity not just in theology but in philosophy with regards to man's nature is an essential role that needs to be put back uh, in a proper understanding of law. So I was just wondering your thoughts on that. And one comment for you uh, uh, as well. You're t I've never heard of the, um, the, the Processus Satani before, but I'm entirely interested in it. But the one thing that it brought to mind to me was actually the Oresteia, is uh, humanity's play the Oresteia, in which at the very end of which, of course, you have this divine inter intervention of Diana, who, in who does what? She instills law, but not law as simply a judgment, but the law of compassion. Because of course the jury of 12, and there's a reason we still have a jury of 12, uh, is divided. And so the divine judgment, uh, and again it's a feminine divine judgment, is one of compassion. Which I think is an interesting track of the way in which the image of the Blessed Virgin is used. I love the idea of the Blessed Virgin as the ultimate lawyer, by the way. Um, uh, the, the way the Blessed Virgin, as this sort of, this, this um, uh, you know, clothed with divinity, and not divine herself of course, but associated with it, um, as this entering into the judicial process but precisely in the mode of compassion. And so I just think there's a lovely parallel between that. There's sort of something ingrained in Western thought with regards to, to especially the divine intervention on this, which I just thought was very interesting. So those are just, I, I, this was created a lot of thoughts for me. I thought this was very interesting, and I just thank you both for a wonderful presentation. Bravissimi. Uh, Patrick, I think you had a question. This question is for Professor Conte, and it follows or parallels in some respects to Helmholtz's earlier question. And that is, how specifically does the codification of canon law only in 1917 fit into your account of the, the um, interface or nexus be, be, between law as a phenomenon in the church and ecclesiology as such? I, don't, I, I did not understand really what's, what's the, the question. What does the church's decision only in 1917 yes. to codify canon law tell us ah, yes, on, yes. on your account mm -hmm. ab about the ecclesiology mm -hmm. that was being sought mm -hmm. at, at the time and maybe the unintended consequences of mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. that kind of codification mm -hmm. for ecclesial life and possibilities. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting. I'm, I'm not a specialist about that. Uh, but of course, it was a decision which went, which followed 
probably the decision of Germany to turn to codification. So Germany, with the historical school, had opposed the idea of codification and had affirmed the idea that uh, uh, the very deep knowledge of history of doctrines is enough to rule a country. And uh, this is exactly what the church thought. This is uh, what the church had done during centuries. Legislation and uh, forms of codification with a collection of uh, uh, decretals issued by the Pope as collections, so form of codification, with titles, with matters, and so order in the statutes. But upon this, a lot of doctrine. So this is very much in tune with the idea of, of, the, of uh, the Savinian historical school in Germany as history devoted to rule the present, not to, to know the past. Uh, but in, in uh, 1901, Germany issued uh, uh, its uh, uh, civil law code. And just after, uh, the church start working at a, a code for uh, canon law, which is ordering the world. It is a new way of ordering the world. Anyway, this is, I, I, I'm sure we, we could say much more about these topics, and it's extremely interesting to, uh, to understand how a church which was so tied to the idea of tradition came to the most innovative uh, uh, tool of a legislator, which is to issue a codification. Richard? So in your presentation, three uh, main sources of, of law that you discussed, the um, canon law of the church, uh, the Roman law, and both of those had uh, some universal principles, at least the Roman law universal for, for much of Europe, and the canon law of the church for, for, for believers uh, in the church. And then the last, I mean, the law from the national identity, the Volksgeist, or in France, of course, the Napoleonic Code that came out of the revolution, and how those three interplay with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and it appears that the story you're telling is that the, uh, the third, the, the, the Volksgeist, the national identity, started to assume more and more importance. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what I didn't hear was the last part of the story that you referred to the tragedies of the 20th century, but mm -hmm. not uh, in detail how the this idea of the Volksgeist, the national identity and the law could be taken to extremes by uh, legal philosophers such as Carl Schmitt in the 20s and the 30s, and uh, the tragic consequences. And the reason I, I mention this is that the only reference is in my casebook with Judge John Noonan um, on professional responsibility and personal professional mm -hmm. responsibilities mm -hmm. of the lawyers. The only um, uh, re reference to what happened in the war that we spend quite a bit of time on is a trial of the German judges and lawyers, prosecutors at Nuremberg. And we discussed before um, that trial transcript the uh, rapid breakdown in the rule of law mm -hmm. in, star in 1933. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much was that mm -hmm. set up? Was Germany mm -hmm. set up for that? Or could other European countries have been set up for that? Mm -hmm. By this mentality that there is a law, a sense of right and wrong that's rooted not in individual liberty or in universal values, Christian values or Roman law, but in a, a national identity. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, those who define the national identity mm -hmm. then define the law and the great dangers mm -hmm. presented by that. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see that so, of in course, that way? It is a, a, a huge and, and very fascinating question. Uh, we, I, I just want to stress one point. These strands of the Germanists, of, of the German historical school, starting from the mid-19th century, uh, uh, started to uh, emphasize the peculiarity of so-called German's institution against Roman law, and uh, started to enroot in Roman law the freedom of individual, and in German law, 
the prevalence of community, Genossenschaft, the group over the individual. This went very slowly through decades to decades, but at the beginning, well, after First World War, this idea that the interest of community was over the rights of the single individual uh, became more and more important and was one of the principle of the program of the Nazi party in 1919. So the idea was that the interest of the nation must prevail over every individual right. And this was very well applied in uh, 1933 in, uh, in Germany. This makes a difference between uh, the German fascism and the Italian fascism. The Italian fascism did not develop such, uh, well, the base is the same, that the nation uh, prevails, the interest of, of the nation prevails over the interests of the single uh, person. But these Germanistic rules, this, uh, this idea which had been developed since the mid 19th century, that the Germans are different. The, for the Germans, it's like, uh, you know, bees. The bees, the single bee is not important. The important is the community of the bees, you know? And you can kill one single bee because nothing happens, because it's not that important. So this has a, plays a certain role in the development of Karl Schmitt uh, constitutional thought and uh, of many other uh, uh, Nazi uh, issues. So uh, we, we can speak about that for, for hours, but I think this is, connects my, uh, my paper of today with your question. Hi, I have a question for Beatrice. Uh, you talked about the, the trial, the last trial in which the Virgin um, intervened. Can you tell us, you said there were many very strong arguments from both parts. Were those arguments based on uh, kind of an essentialist view of human nature, or were they somehow rooted in historical particularity of the time? Uh, uh, my, my point about last judgment is, uh, uh, so uh, for Peter Lombard, is not a trial because no one can defend himself. Uh, there is no witnesses, no, no, no proof, nothing. Only Christ. This is not a trial. But uh, uh, the problem is, is not what is the last judgment, of course, but the model of the last judgment for the human judgment. So the idea is that God choose the trial, the procedure for justice, both in heaven and in heart, and not the ordeal, the miracle, because God in medieval theology can everything, of course, is God. He is God. But, uh, the, the logical reasoning about justice, regard human justice, the model for all disputes between the person. So the interpretation of the scriptures is over, is forced, because Matthew Gospels doesn't speak at all about guardian angel, about witnesses, about proof, about prosecutors. No, oh, if you read the Gospels, you, you read that uh, Jesus Christ in the form of human, because all the humans must see the judge, he will decide about salvation or damnation. Stop. So the, the medieval theological and juridical thought works together to, uh, to give 
a model of procedure that, that is like a, a liturgy. There's no difference. Because, for example, Guillaume Durand, uh, he uh, wrote Speculum Judiciale, the handbook of procedure, but he wrote also the, the best uh, works about liturgy. So, uh, the connection is uh, very close. I hope to answer. Thank you. I don't see other hands. If we have five more minutes, maybe I could use my prerogative to ask a question. Um, uh, you know, the, the, both of the papers really have put me in mind of a topic that Judge Noonan devoted a lot of thought to, which is the development of moral doctrine. In some ways, I think that's his most interesting scholarly area, at least for me. And if you look at the book that he wrote when he was at Notre Dame, a church that can and cannot change, you'll find that expressed in, in ways that I think are, have the typical kind of Judge Noonan elusive power to them. Experience and new perceptions compel the abandonment of past positions. What is required is found in the community's experience as it tests what is vital. These are ideas underlying his ideas about how doctrines in slavery and um, marriage and uh, other uh, areas developed. I guess my question for you is, how do those ideas tie in, if they do, to your notion of a legal history in which something happened? Mm -hmm. um, are, are these the same kind of levers that are moving legal history in your view, or is that a different type of development? Mm -hmm. I saved the toughest question for last, but. <laughs> Probably, well, well the, the question is, are the lawyers always the same? <laughs> so the, law, the techniques used by lawyers is always the techniques of using arguments in order to defend a certain point of view. This point of view can be the point of view of a client in, in, in a trial, or the point of view of a ruler of a government who wants to introduce a certain new rule in order to rule economy, to make an example, and have to find good arguments to say that this new law is right, no, is just. So the lawyers are there and are formed to be able to use, to, to, to deal with a vast amount of different argument they have to use. And they have to be able to use all this, to this all this repertory of, uh, of different argument. This has been true since the beginning of legal science in the 12th century. I will be pretty sure of that. And to be uh, and, and to get in tune with what Beatrice said, uh, this is true not only for lawyers of the 12th century, but also for theologians. Uh, every ruler needed a council of lawyers and theologians to cope with the problems he faced every day. So he asked to this specialist, to these professionals, to help him in deciding cases, in issuing new statutes, in taking decisions about ruling the territory, and always needed someone who gathered together the good argument to say, you are right, you have to do that. Or sometimes, probably also, you have not to do that. It's dangerous. In the Middle Ages, the, well, the very different things, that the, the counselor said, it will be very dangerous for your soul. You will go to hell if you do that. And the ruler was really afraid of that. Today probably he is not. <laughs> okay. Terrific, thanks so much. Those are two great papers and uh, excellent questions. Thanks very much, Beatrice and Emanuele.